You may be seated. Well, welcome to HBF this morning. It is so good to see you all. I mean, I love that song we just sang. It's an incredible, it's an incredible song. Uh, we have a, this is going to be a unique day at HBF, so we're going to do several things, a little out of order. So if you're joining us live, on, uh, live online, we're glad to have you with us, and uh, we're glad that you're with us. This morning, uh, I normally do this, reserve this to the end, but we have a, another acknowledgement at the end that we're going to do, so I'll hold uh, on that. But initially, uh, what I want to do this morning is just recognize uh, our, our newest members. And so uh, we have two folks that came forward for baptism, Olivia and Lily uh, Bruner, and uh, they were baptized. How many were here to see that? That was good. That was a couple weeks ago, so that was exciting. Uh, I want to just invite uh, Olivia and Lily up. I see them hiding out over here. Did you guys know this was coming today? Okay, I hope you did. So uh, Olivia and Lily, they, these are our newest members to HBF. Now, I normally do this on the floor, but tonight or today I'm going to ask that you guys come up here, and uh, you, can use, you can come up. All, all, yeah, that's good. There's steps over here on the way out, but you're good. Come on. So you're all right. So, uh, so uh, I want to I give you guys a little packet. Um, and let's see. Lily? Yeah, there we go. Lily and Olivia. I get them confused. Um, so Lily and Olivia, you guys were baptized. And now, um, you know, we, had, we talked about salvation. We went through that. We, we followed the Lord in obedience to his command. And so when we talked about that, we talked about baptism, how it's about identification. And so uh, what we're doing now is acknowledging the fact that, that, you know, you're born again. You've followed the Lord in the first act of obedience, which is believer's baptism. And now this is us acknowledging before everybody that you are members of the body of Christ because you're in Christ. So if you're in favor of receiving these as members of HBF, just say a hearty amen. 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 Awesome. So praise the Lord. Amen. So praise the Lord. Now, we usually have an awkward time where we make you stand at the front and everybody comes by and they greet you and all that, but that's at the end. So since we're doing it out of order, you don't have to do that today. But you guys know who they are, right? And so uh, when you have a chance, encourage them personally, welcome them to the, the family of God and thank them for uh, following the Lord in obedience. So thank you guys very much. God bless you. All right. Um, so a lot of things are going on this morning. I'm excited about all that's going on. Bob, how are we doing with the Sierra Leone project? Yeah, we're wrapping. We are literally crossing the finish line. We're stretching our neck forward to get to that tape. So praise the Lord. Thank you for everybody that's been a part of that. And uh, thank you. For looking forward to the Bible conferences coming up. We've done as much in the last several weeks with the, this project for Sierra Leone and these Bibles that are going to a key place at a key time that we would do in a whole Bible conference. 5,000 whole Bibles is a lot of Bibles to assemble. And so uh, we praise the Lord for that. That's, a, that's a quite an accomplishment. And also, I, I need to mention, especially since we're online, a special thanks to everybody, not just HBF, but all the f- folks that came from everywhere. I know Bethel Baptist of Warrensburg came out, Midtown sent people cyclically, and there's other folks that have come from all over to be a part of that. So we praise God for that harvest and, and, uh, and Graceway and all the folks that brought people out. Um, is Chris Cohen in the house? There he is. Chris, Chris has a couple announcements and some encouragement. So if Chris could come up, he's going he's gonna to speak just a moment, and then I'm going to. So I just want to speak a few things on uh, a few things that are coming up for our VBS. Uh, we have about a week left, a week and a day, and uh, this whole place is going to be turned into a mystery island. And so I want to just uh, thank everybody who's already uh, been here volunteering with the decorations. And I want to thank all the ones that are volunteering that are going to be taking part of that. I know it's a, it's a huge commitment. It's a week-long deal, and it takes up a big part of your evening. And so I just want to appreciate everybody that's uh, taking part of that. Uh, so we've got a couple days just to kind of put on our brains and think about. This Saturday is our big, huge work day. It's going to be from uh, 9 to 5. So anybody that's able to show up just for a little bit of your time is uh, going to be greatly appreciated. Uh, we'll possibly have a few snacks to maybe encourage you to, to join us. Uh, then also on Sunday after service, uh, we're going to do it at 1 o'clock. We're going to have another work day, and that's also going to be our final meeting where uh, anybody that still wants to volunteer, still feel free to show up. We're, uh, we're not going to count you out. And so also uh, something to kind of think about on Saturday, we're going to do what's kind of called a prayer walk. And uh, we're going to go around and we're going to just take a moment of time and 
Uh, we're going to go pray over all the areas where all the kids will be and, and pray that they hear the gospel and pray that they receive the gospel. And so that is something that you can do. Even if you're not able to volunteer with us, you can always pray. And that's something that we can do anywhere. So uh, we uh, covet your prayers and we really appreciate them. Uh, we know there's a lot of going on in this time uh, with, the, with, the, with the COVID. And so I want to encourage everybody that we are taking precautions for your kids. And so that is my final thing that I want to uh, kind of get you to do. If you have not already done so, I want you to sign your kids up if you can. we got one week left. So the sooner we can get your kids signed up, the sooner we can get a schedule planned out and figure out a rotation. And so we really appreciate everything. And so uh, be praying for that. Uh, we're really thankful for that. My wife and I are really encouraged by it this year, and uh, we think we're still going to have a turnout, good turnout despite everything that's going on. So thank you, and uh, God bless. Really appreciate all that Chris and Lauren are doing to get VBS off this year with all the different uh, uh, challenges that we've had. It's been, a, it's been a unique year, and uh, they've done a tremendous job of improvising, adapting, and overcoming along with the rest of the body of Christ. So that's, uh, that's really what it's about, is uh, accomplishing God's mission and God's power for God's glory. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts. We're gonna, I'm going to preach the Word this morning. That's what we do. And uh, thanks, uh, Jim Boy, that filled in last week. And praise God. I don't know, there's a young man that received Christ last week. I don't know if he's in the house, but praise God for that. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him in heaven and I hope, hopefully here at church as well in the days, weeks, years, and months ahead. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, we turn to the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 28. Now, we concluded our, our time in Acts, but I wanted to go back and just really put a conclusion on the entire thing. And I may or may not get it in in the time that we have, so we'll finish this when we finish it. But Acts chapter 28, if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from the seat rack in front of you, and you can turn to page 1500, uh, 1500 in that HBF uh, Bible that we have in the seat rack. And uh, today we conclude this study uh, completely. Uh, or when I complete this message, uh, it'll be complete. And we'll have officially covered the text, and we've done all that. But this morning, I want to just kind of bounce off some of those final comments that Paul made uh, in his ministry and uh, give an exhortation on how we can apply uh, and take action upon what we've learned in the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, uh, let's just stand together. Let's look. This isn't going to take us long, but I want to stand in honor of God's Word. Acts chapter 28 page 1500, if you're looking at one of those HBF Bibles and trying to find out where we are. Uh, Acts chapter 28, we're going to be in verse 30. I think everyone's uh, fairly familiar by now with the text and all the situations. So I just want to pick up the last two verses. Acts chapter 28, verse 30, the Bible says, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word that is true. We thank you for this time that we've had uh, over a year's worth of time in the book of Acts, Lord. And we pray, God, uh, that you would just take this time that we have this morning to just help kind of wrap that up and, and really give us some action items. And act on Acts. That's the name of the, the title this morning, Lord. I pray, God, that the word of God would stir us up to, to be people of action. This morning we've seen people that have taken action. We've seen people that have come to Christ and then gotten baptized. We've seen people that are involved in ministry and, and getting things ready for the vacation Bible school coming up the first full week of August. Or we've seen people uh, throughout the, the day preaching and teaching in adult Bible fellowships and uh, preparing things for uh, what's yet to come at the end of the day. And Lord, we're thankful for all the activity. And Lord, in this activity, Lord, it's all in vain without you. So Father, we call upon you this morning to meet with us. We just sang about the altar, or we sang about coming before your throne. I pray, Heavenly Father, this morning that you would speak to your church as only you can from your word. Heavenly Father, that you would encourage us, that you would encourage us to take action on what we've learned in the book of Acts, Lord. Not just encourage us, but empower us, Lord. And Lord, take us where we need to go for your honor and glory and for your namesake. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so, uh, I've always found the conclusion of Acts rather open-ended. You know, even before the sermon series, I always got to those last verses, and I thought, wow, that's just kind of a, it's just kind of left open, you know? And I think God does that on purpose. I think I mentioned that a few weeks ago, because it really never ends. And, and Luke just leaves it. He leaves it in Rome, and the Holy Ghost didn't move anyone to update the ending with events in Second Timothy or any of those things. It just is left right there. And that's because God has given us exactly what we need to apply 
uh, what we've learned in the book of Acts. As we find Paul in Rome, he preached the kingdom of God and taught those things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Period. That's where we left it. And that's where God left it. And so when we started our first uh, series in Acts in January 28th of 2018, uh, uh, man, that's a long time ago, uh, I taught this that, that Acts is a transitional book. It's a historical book. It's also a call to action. It, it includes doctrine as well, of course, but, but it really does call us to action. And that does, does not negate that it, is, it, it has the doctrine that is so important. But it's, because it's transitional, you have to be very careful with what it is teaching. It's really teaching us uh, that it is a transition. And, and so it's important that we understand that and we see that so we can rightly divide the word of truth. Acts is very critical in that. And as you go to the first chapter of Acts, you might remember the very first question that we find there is in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, when, therefore they were, uh, there, when they therefore come together, speaking of the apostles, uh, they asked him, Jesus, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And so this is a question that's looming large in the mind of the disciples, and we've covered all of that. And in, in a different way, we're still asking that same question today, aren't we? Uh, not, in, we are asking, well, it really is, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Because we left off last, or a couple of weeks ago talking about the spiritual nature of the kingdom of God. Our inheritance is spiritual. The physical inheritance of the nation of Israel is still intact. God will still bless Israel with all those covenant promises that he gave Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and they will be restored in the land. The last book in our Bible, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ given to us through the apostle John, reveals to us what is going to happen in regard to Daniel's 70th week. So Israel will indeed be able to get their physical inheritance in the promised land. Now you say, well, they're already there. Yeah, they are, but they're not born again, right? They're dead, but they're dead. In, they're there, but they're dead in trespass and sins. They, as a nation, have not been quickened yet. And so they need a new birth spiritually as a nation. So that's all going to take place in a time yet to come. But it is important because we just covered Acts. And so it's just another book. Let's just move on to the next thing to, you know, titillate our, our understanding, to, to itch our ears so we can just keep going to church and keep the ball rolling. But that's not really what we're all about here at HBF. We're about really not just teaching the Bible, but we got to apply it. I mean, this is really, this is real. So we are in history and we are moving forward and it is his story and so Acts is important. And so you've got to take all of this teaching, which has been voluminous, and boil it down to a few things so that we can go forward and carry the ball across the finish line because our time on earth is short, no matter how you cut it. If you live 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, your, your life is a vapor. It appears for a little while and it vanishes away. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And if the Lord comes tomorrow, hallelujah. If he comes today, praise the Lord. Maybe before I get done preaching, he'll catch us away. That will be awesome. And, but in the meantime, right, we need to be about the business. And so they're asking that question. When are you going to restore the kingdom again to Israel? Now, we're not like the apostles because we know, we saw a couple of weeks ago, we've got the revelation. We've got the New Testament given to us. So we know how to rightly divide. We know what time it is. We understand what God is doing. And so, and so we aren't asking that same question in the same way. Now we're saying, hey, Lord, how long, right? How, the fullness of the Gentiles is coming in. Right, how long before you catch us away so you can fulfill what you've already told us you're going to do with the nation of Israel? We understand things uh, with much more clarity because God has given us his word, because of what God did with the Apostle Paul and the mysteries revealed in the New Testament. So the way Paul concludes his time in Rome is exactly the way we need to conclude our time on earth. Actively continuing teaching scripture until Jesus returns for his Gentile bride. That's what we ought to be doing. Actively continuing teaching scripture until Jesus returns for his Gentile bride. Now, if you didn't catch that, that is an acrostic. So I'm going to have a few of those this morning. And uh, you can find the complete sermon notes uh, on what I'm about to give you uh, on, my, on the website um, uh, regarding... I sent out an email this morning if you guys want to see what I'm about to do. I want to review with you uh, another acrostic that I gave you uh, back at the, on January the 28th of 2018. Uh, and just kind of fly over quickly uh, some of the things about the book of Acts that we, I introduced to you, things that we covered. And then I want to wrap this up, Lord willing, if time permits, uh, with concluding comments that we need to go forward with in regard to the book of Acts. And so again, there, I'm going to go through a lot of volume here right now, and I want you guys to know, don't freak out if you can't get it all. It is all online. You can go to our, our website. It's all in PDFs. So you can download it and you can see it. You can keep it for posterity. So, first thing I want to remember and review 
as we fly over the book of Acts, as we, I had that, 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 that acrostic about Acts. Acts, well, what about Acts? And then the contrast in Acts, the transitional nature of Acts, the spirit of God in Acts. That's the first things that we covered uh, many, many, many weeks ago. And so when we talked about Acts, we saw that uh, we looked at the author at first, and we saw that the author, of course, is God, but he used Luke as human instrumentation. And, and when he did that, the epistle of Luke uh, speaks to, to what Christ did on earth through his physical body, because Luke didn't just write the book of Acts. He also wrote the book, the epistle of Luke. Um, and so that dealt with his physical body. The epistle of Acts really speaks to the work of Christ through his spiritual body. And that's where we really leave off with the apostle Paul. He is building, God is building his church, as he said, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus is building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Paul is sitting in the seat of Gentile power, inviting people to his, his uh, home uh, or his place of, uh, of uh, bondage and uh, with free freedom. And he is just simply teaching the kingdom of God, teaching the body of Christ what Christ has for them. And then we saw the, uh, the apostles' uh, information in Acts chapters 1 and 2 and, um, and Acts, uh, Acts 1, 2 and Acts 1, 13. And we saw their identity and authority are defined and displayed in the book of Acts. And we talked a lot more about that in the introduction. But nothing else is said of Mary. We found that in the book of Acts, that, that Mary is only mentioned in Acts 1.14. No one ever mentioned her, is mentioned praying to Mary, uh, talking to Mary. Uh, no one even calls Mary the blessed among women. Um, no one considered Mary to be immaculately conceived and sinless. No one is recorded as honoring Mary above that of their own mother. And notice that Jesus' brethren were present in the book of Acts, chapter 1. So Mary was a, was a virgin at Jesus' birth, but she and Joseph went on to have children. And Mark 6, 3 mentions Jesus has four brothers, James, Joseph, Judah, and uh, Simon, as well as sisters. So uh, one of the things that Acts does is clears up a lot, right off the bat in the first chapter, a lot of misinformation about uh, who Jesus was and who Mary was, who the apostles were, and all of those things. Then we looked at some contrasts in the book of Acts. We saw that Acts reveals several contrast. We saw the contrast of cowardly disciples, right? And then the courageous apostles. I mean, at Jesus' death, they all left. You know, John went to the cross, but the rest of them fled. And fled. Peter, the lead disciple, ends up, you know, uh, denying Jesus thrice. And so the, the contrast is amazing. In Acts 1 through 12 and Acts 13 uh, through 28, the, we also see the contrast of the holy city being Jerusalem um, and then uh, and with the world, we see that Jerusalem is that holy city in Acts 1 through 12. In Acts 13 through 28, um, the, the, God's getting the, the message not to just the people in Jerusalem and the holy city. He's getting it to the whole world. And we find Paul, of course, sitting in Rome in Acts chapter 28. So then we also saw the contrast of Antioch and Alexandria. And we kept bringing that up, even there toward the end. In Acts 11, 26, the Bible says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And from Antioch came the first Gentile church, the first missions movement, the first diverse pastoral team. In Acts 18, 24, uh, we saw that Apollos came from Alexandria. In Acts, we saw the contrast between Peter and Paul. Peter was prominent in Acts 1 through 12, as Paul was prominent in Acts 13 through 28. Acts also reveals the contrast between the Jews and the Gentiles. The unbelieving Jews were looking for signs. Uh, like at Pentecost, you know, fulfilling uh, those, those uh, prophecies and, and looking for the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. We see that in Acts chapter 10, 46, uh, the Jews with signs confirmed that the Gentiles had received the Holy Ghost. And then the unbelieving Gentiles were looking for wisdom. Paul was, was preaching on Mars Hill in Acts 17. And, uh, and, of course, we know from 1 Corinthians 1, that the Bible says, Jews require a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. And then we also saw the contrast in the response to the gospel. You know, revival resulted at the preaching of the gospel in Acts 19. People were, I mean, all the way through the beginning of the book of Acts and through the entire book of Acts, but especially in the beginning, there was incredible revival at the preaching of the gospel. But also riots broke out. You got this extreme polarization at the preaching of the word of God, just like today, oftentimes, when you preach the word of God. And then there was contrast between the, the uh, conflict and conversion as Satan withstood the gospel. Satan was against the gospel all the way through the book of Acts. It's like a chess match. God is moving. The devil's moving. Uh, and Satan withstood the gospel in Acts 4.18. Uh, he, they, were banning, they were banned to preach the apostles through the Sanhedrin. In Acts 8.18, Satan attempts to buy off the preachers. In Acts 16.16-18, 16, 16 Satan attempts to blur the preaching of the gospel. And he's got all these devices that he uses to try to hinder the gospel. 
And then there was this demonic activity that went on. Satan used sorcerers in Acts 8, 9 and Acts 13, 6. Satan used a damsel possessed with the devil in Acts 16, 16 through 18. And then there was the the contrast of this great conversion that was happening among the key people groups of the earth uh, because because the gospel is not bound. And so there were three sons and three groups of people that came from Noah, right? And we all come from Adam's sinful race. That, That solves a lot of problems in our culture today, if everybody could just figure that out. We're all of one blood. That's, and that's a problem. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, that's why Jesus had to die on the cross so we can be saved by his blood. But those three boys that came off the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, you guys know those three. They're represented in the book of Acts. As, and, and, they, and there's examples of their salvation. The Ethiopian eunuch is saved in Acts 8. And he's a Hamite. The Shemite, uh, Paul, was saved in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. What an incredible salvation that was. In history, records that that salvation of the Ethiopian eunuch was amazing. I mean, these were key people at key times, going to key people groups. And then at last, uh, we see Cornelius, uh, that centurion, that Japhethite, that Gentile, that uh, he, he brings, he brings uh, Peter in, and a whole group of Gentiles gets saved. I mean, an incredible conversions were happening. And the conversions were, were large uh, in number. Uh, in Acts 1, uh, fi- uh, 115, there was 120 saved. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Uh, we'd, we'd have a heyday of 120 people all of a sudden just jumped up to get saved. We'd be fired up. But that was, hey, Acts 2.41, uh, 3,120 people got saved, right? And then in Acts 4.14, 8,120 people getting saved. In Acts 5.14, an innumerable amount of conversions. I mean, God was bringing in a harvest, praise God. And then we saw the, the transitional nature, right? We saw some information about Acts, contrast, contrast in Acts, and transitional nature of Acts. This is a really important doctrinal aspect of the book of Acts, as I've already mentioned. And so we saw the transition from Israel's rejection to the church's inception. And we saw that there was that first rejection in Acts 7. That was formal and official. That was the death of Stephen. Um, But we actually see three uh, chances prior to that in Acts 2.37, Acts 4.8, and and then Acts 7 for Israel in Jerusalem to receive their Messiah. And they rejected him there in Jerusalem. The second rejection, rejection is in Acts 13, 46 through 47, as the Jews in Asia, Asia Minor reject uh, the preaching of Paul. The third rejection then is in Acts 18, 6, and the Jews in the European mainland and the uttermost reject Paul. And of course, we saw in Acts chapter 28, the church age is in full effect and Paul is done in Rome, in, in, the, in Rome as the Jews there. Uh, he just preaches the, the prophecies of the Old Testament, says, God's done with you guys. Uh, I'm going to the Gentiles. And the church is in full effect. So we saw the transition from the Old Testament canon to the New Testament canon. Acts is one of the three transitional books in the New Testament. A lot of people misunderstand uh, that so much, uh, so many things from the Bible because they, they take doctrine out of, uh, out of transitional books and don't know how to put those in the right context, which is the first rule of Bible study. And so uh, there are three transitional books that you need to really be aware of in your New Testament that are critical for understanding the rest of your Bible. Number one is Matthew, as that transitions from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The book of Acts uh, transitions from Israel, transitions from Israel to the church. And then the book of Hebrews transitioning from the church uh, to the tribulation period, which is yet to come after the catching away of the church, or what's called the rapture. And so we see some things about Acts. We see contrast in Acts. We see uh, the, the uh, transitional nature of Acts. But what's also very important and what's also very confusing today in our culture is the Spirit of God in Acts. So again, a lot of that bad doctrine gets straightened out if you just put the Bible in context. In context. And so as we went through the book of Acts, we saw that the Holy Ghost uh, was promised by John in Matthew 3.11. Uh, he says, hey, he, this man Jesus, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Uh, right? And so praise God, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost descended upon the church. Uh, for those that don't get saved and those that don't really take the gospel seriously, you will learn about the baptism of fire at a later date. There's a lot of mockers and scoffers going around uh, today, and uh, they minimize the gospel. They minimize the truth of God's word. Unfortunately, they will miss what the baptism of the Spirit is all about, which is what occurs when we get saved. Uh, Acts chapter, or Ephesians 4 speaks to that very clearly, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So when you reject the, the Spirit of God, when you reject the gospel... There is another baptism reserved for you. It's a baptism of fire. And it's not what you saw in Acts chapter 2 with cloven tongues. That's not the right definition of that. So, uh, and so uh, the Holy Ghost was promised by Jesus at his ascension. He says, hey guys, before you get too fired up to go preach, just hold tight. I told you what to do, but you're going to have to wait. But then in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God descends and dwells the church. And I, and I, and I, I teach that is when the church was born. Obviously, she was developing 
And, uh, and we see that process as it transitions into the book of Acts as Israel rejects their Messiah once again. So the Holy Ghost provided uh, to, Jeru- to the Jews in Jerusalem on Pentecost in Acts 2, 16 through 17. And then the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. And Peter didn't know what to do. He just said, well, I guess they've got the spirit from just hearing the message. So I guess we're just going to have to baptize them. And we've been following that pattern ever since. The spirit of God indwells us upon believing and receiving the gospel. And then after that, we follow in believer's baptism uh, because that is how we identify. We, we show that we have identified with Christ and he has identified with us through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Acts uh, has a lot of information there. And that's the, the, the thing that we've... we've uh, covered many, many years ago, uh, not years ago, but over a year and a half ago. And uh, now I'm sure you guys remembered every one of those points and it was all just simple review. All right. So I did that real fast for a reason because that's just kind of introductory information. But I I really want to get to the acting on acts. And I wanted to kind of set that forth and just kind of remind you of really, we just flew over the book of acts, you know, from beginning to end in just a few minutes. Uh, And uh, now that we've we've reviewed all of that and we've learned and, and covered at length in acts, a lot of detail. I want to take uh, the rest of our time, or as much time as I have left, and, and just get into the, these, these last two verses and, and really wrap up our time in Acts was, and, and encourage us in action. I want us to go forward and do something with what we've learned. Because what I just gave you is a lot of information. Praise God. You know, there's a lot of churches today that don't give you any information. <laughs> so praise God, we got information. But you know what? Knowledge puffs up. Charity edifies. So we got to take the knowledge that we have and we got to apply it. And so... Uh, we left off in Acts 28, 30 through 31, with Paul preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things uh, which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Let me ask you this morning. How confident are you in what you know about the Bible and what you teach? That's just a good question. If this is the end of your story, right, where would it leave you? Are you today, are you confident? Can you teach people the Bible? You say, well, Brian, I'm not called to be a missionary, I'm not called to be a pastor, I'm not called to be a teacher. Well, maybe you're not, but you certainly should be teaching people the Bible, no matter who you are, if you're born again, if you're a Christian. And you need to have confidence in that. And that's one of the reasons we have a church here that equips the saints of God in the Word of God to accomplish the mission of God and the power of God for the glory of God, because ultimately, the mission of the church is to equip you to live out the Word of God, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ so that you can learn from him and be, and be quickened in a way that people know you are different and your life changes other people's lives. You draw people into the kingdom of God. You teach them about the kingdom of God. You encourage them with confidence in the kingdom of God. Do you do that? Do I do that? Those are questions I ask myself. Am I that guy? I need to be that guy. I don't want to get to the end of my life and be that dude who dropped the ball, who fumbled. You know, you want to, you want to get across the goal line. And so... As we await the Lord's return, I want to challenge us to actively continue teaching Scripture, just as Paul did. Uh, Paul, today, some of our, our members are like, are like the Apostle Paul. Uh, they're even under house arrest because of COVID. They can't get out. They can't be here. They're watching online today. They're probably putting a shout out right now on the, on the webpage, on the YouTube or whatever they're watching on. You know what? And they are. Thumbs are going up. Right? Right now. Thank you, guys. We love you. But just because you're under house arrest, you know what? It didn't stop Paul. Paul was under house arrest, and yet he was still ministering the gospel. Just because you can't get out and circulate doesn't mean that you cannot circulate for Jesus. God still uses our relationships. He's, God's given us technology today so we as Christians can communicate with the entire world without ever leaving our desk. It's an amazing thing. I'm, ta- I'm routinely talking with people all over the earth. Uh, Just like they're next door or right in front of me. It's no big deal because of the technology that God has given us. And so we we see that that liberty is under attack, not just in our nation, but really around the world. And it's not just a political issue. Because there's only one person that really makes you free and can set you free. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we talk about liberty, we're not just talking about a revolutionary war, a United States Constitution... That's great stuff, but that actually is just born out of the liberty that's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That will fade. That will go away. We know that because we know the end of the story. But what won't go away is the Lord Jesus Christ and the freedom we find in him. We literally are unstoppable. That's why Paul's confident. Whether you take his life or not, there is no stopping Paul. 
There used to be a rap song, You Can't Stop Me or something. My son always used to play that thing. You Can't Stop I think it's Andy Minio. Anybody know that? Let me just see here. <laughs> Two people. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Somebody out in the stratosphere is like, yeah, I know that. So anyway, you can't stop me. There's some truth to that. You couldn't stop Paul. He was confident, man. He just said, bring it on. God's making a way. And beloved, we need to have that kind of half full attitude. You know that? Because there's a lot of half empty going on today. We need to have confidence and we need to be teaching the word of God. We need to actively, right? Continue. Uh, or actively teach scripture. I'm trying to, I'm getting my acronym all messed up. What was it? What was it? I said, actively continue teaching scripture. It's an acrostic really. Not an act, uh, and so we need to do that. No matter what, no matter what the, is going on with COVID. So we all see that, that that is the case today. And a lack of spirit filled Christianity has produced somewhat of a vacuum that Satan is really ready to fill and is actively filling. And the Bible said it would be like that. So how are we going to play out the story? Because it's his story. We have a decision to make. We, like Paul, will be faithful no matter the circumstances, or we'll falter, we'll fold, and we'll find ourselves wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I mean, it's, it's our decision. It's really our decision with what we do, what we've learned in Acts. In a time of transition, what did, what did the apostles do? Did they fold up? Did they quit? Did they throw their hands in the air? What did they do? They kept going. They kept going with the mission of God, with the word of God, with the promises of God, because that's all you can do. There is no other direction to go but forward for Christ. The circumstances are really irrelevant because Jesus Christ has already won. And you are the victor, regardless of who recognizes it. And so that's what we do. That's why we proclaim the good news. Jesus Christ, you know what? The good news is good no matter what the circumstances because Jesus Christ makes up the difference. It's an incredible thing. So in, a time, in the time I have remaining, I want to challenge you with the final Acts acrostic that I want to give you uh, for this series. And I'm starting at the first one is act like Christ. That's the thing that we've got to do. And I'm going to take you back to Acts chapter 11 and verse 22. Acts 11, 22, act like Christ. In Acts 11, 22, the Bible says, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came, he had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And so the first thing that we're going to see here is that Christians that act like Christ foster fellowship. You know, we, got to, we need to be, you know, it used to be a thing, be like Mike. No, we need to be like Christ. And, and, and Christians that foster, uh, or uh, Christians that act like Christ foster fellowship. We see that in the text that we just read. You know, and if you're going to foster fellowship, what you're going to do is you're going to seek salty saints. You're going to seek salty saints. And when I say salt, we have some sailors in here. That's a different connotation, perhaps, than you might use in the Navy. But we're talking about salty in regard to, well, it is the same in regard to experience, right? Not experience necessarily in sailing or worldly events, but, but people who are experiencing a real, vivid, live, real relationship with Jesus Christ, who are living out the Word of God. The church of Jerusalem sent Barnabas to encourage the churches, and he ended up finding a key church and that church, of course, is Antioch of Syria. This was a church that manifests the grace of God, it says in the text. And it was a place where Barnabas exhorted them all to cleave unto the Lord. So Barnabas is an encourager, but he goes to a place that's encouraging. Because he gets to a place in a situation. By the way, it's a time of persecution. And he gets to this place, and the grace of God is upon it. And he is encour he's an encourager, but he's also encouraged. And he stays in Antioch, and he spends some time there. And Barnabas didn't just stay there and get encouraged, even though he was an encourager. It was good for Barnabas, and Barnabas was good for Antioch. But Barnabas went out of his way to leave Antioch and go up to Tarsus and grab Paul so he could invest the mysteries that God had given him in the church manifesting, that was manifesting the grace of God. And God bestowed upon this church information, knowledge about who he is and what he's doing in his kingdom. 
Not because they were the biggest church. Not because they were in the most geographically, uh, you know, best place to be on the world. You know, there were other cities like Jerusalem or Rome that were definitely more key in regard to, to a, uh, the metrics that you might want to use to measure those things. But what God was looking at was a group of people that were full of grace and that, that, that were people that loved God's word. They were an eclectic group of people. They were from all different races and different. There was no racial tension there because they were one in Christ. And Barnabas, the encourager, shows up, that exhorter, and he comes and says, man, you know what? I'm going to go grab Paul. Not just because the church needed what Paul had and could be trusted with what Paul had, but also because Paul needed a place. Because where was Paul going to go? He couldn't hang out at the synagogue. Every synagogue he went to ended up splitting. I mean, uh, when he went to Jerusalem, they wanted to kill him. I mean, he, they didn't even trust him. So where did Paul find community? Well, he found it in a place called Antioch. The Bible says that, that Barnabas... Man, he took Paul down to Jerusalem, and, and, he, and he chose to bring him to this place of grace and invest the riches of the Word of God in these people who'd be responsible, who'd be responsible to fulfill the mission, the mission of God. And we learned in our study that, that Antioch was a key church in regard to what it accomplished for, uh, for God. It wasn't Jerusalem. Jerusalem continued to, to falter, but in the missionary movement of the New Testament, Antioch is, is a beam of light. It's the church that sent Paul and Barnabas out on those missionary journeys. It's the church that, that Paul made sure he checked back with in, in regard to what was going on, as well as Jerusalem. And, and credit to Jerusalem, by the way. They did at least send Barnabas out, and he ended up in Antioch, praise God. And so Jesus' instruction to the apostles in Acts 1-8 would be go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. It was from Antioch where that actually was being accomplished. Paul was good for Antioch because he established them in God's word. But Antioch was good for Saul because he found a place of fellowship and acceptance in a church that he wasn't going to find anywhere else. And today, many independent fundamental Baptists have become so legalistic that Ichabod is on the door of that church. Now, obviously, if you're saved, the Spirit of God dwells in you. But I'm not, I'm not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit personally. I'm talking about the activity of the Spirit's ability to use people. Legalism, regardless of its, if, if it's, it's Judaism or even in independent Baptist circles, can, can just cause the door to shut in regard to God using you like you would like to. But just like license, too. You can get so lascivious that God can't use you either, so there is a balance in between there. And just like the, the meetings in the synagogue, there, there's no grace, there's no acceptance. They couldn't handle Paul in the synagogue. They couldn't handle the Word of God. And, because, and they couldn't handle the fact that God had radically altered this man's life to the point that he was now preaching the man that he used to persecute. But you know what? That's the kind of change that you see in a church that's full of grace. You see lives absolutely changed. You know, we still... Uh, I was just talking to someone the other day that, that knows uh, uh, Mark Chadwick. Mark's not here now. He's up at Harvest of Blue Springs, him and Lindsay. They just had, they had a baby, by the way. Congratulations. But when, uh, someone I was talking to, I don't remember who it was, they, they never knew Mark with the spiked hairdo. How many of you remember Mark? Remember with the, yeah, several of you. Remember, remember Mark? He rolls in with the spiked hairdo. I mean, like this long and blue or purple or something, right? He had some nose rings and everything. I don't know what it is. This, like, who is this dude? He's a dude that walked the aisle, got saved one day. And no one said, hey, why don't you cut your hair? Why don't you take out the nose rings? You know, whatever. You know what? God did all that. He doesn't really wear that hair like that anymore, at least that I'm aware of. Um, you know why? Because God changed his life. Praise God. He changes a lot of our lives. That doesn't mean you have to be that radical with spiked hair. But anyway, uh, but you know, God changes people's lives. Paul's life was radically altered. And he needed a place of fellowship. Man, I pray that HBF is that place. We got folks in here that come from all kinds of places. And, 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 and frankly, are rejected, and sometimes for really good reasons. But you know what? We got to believe that God can change people's lives. That doesn't mean we don't prove all things, and we don't hold fast to that, which is good, but it means we believe God can do that. We believe the gospel is that powerful, because if, if he can change Paul's life, well, guess what? He can change your life, and guess what? He's changed my life. He can change lives. So Christians that act like Christ, they assemble with the saints. We see that Paul and Barnabas assembled with the saints in Antioch a whole year. While they were there, they taught much people. And if you name the name of Christ and you call yourself a Christian but cannot commit to assembling with the saints, well, you're really missing out. You're really disobedient, frankly. Um, and, and so a few of our members take advantage of all the church has to offer. I mean, all of it. 
If you just sit under the teaching of your ABF, your Adult Bible Fellowship at 9 o'clock, you come to worship service, you're here Sunday night to pray, and you show up on Wednesday night. If you did that alone, and then you got involved in Discipleship 1, I guarantee you, I guarantee you in one year, your life will be radically different. You're not going to say it with a willing heart, if you, not because of constraint, but willingly. So if you, if, you, if you committed yourself to the things of God for one year like that, your life is going to be altered. You're going to be different. You're, you're going to be like Christ. You're going to look like Christ. You're gonna, people are going to see you, whether you know it or not, and they're going to say they're a Christian. They're like Jesus. Something has changed in their life. Now, that was a derogatory term. We learned all that, right? But you know what? It's a derogatory term today. Uh, many who name the name of Christ really don't want their lives changed today. Why is being a Christian derogatory? Well, when you're lost, lost people always like to pick out the hypocrisy. Well, I know a Christian, blah, 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 blah. And Christians are so dumb, they fall into it. They're like, well, I want to be relevant. You know what? Forget relevance. Be Jesus. Be like Christ. Because you're irrelevant if you're not. I get tired of all that. I used to subscribe to that, that magazine, Relevant, and then I had to quit because it just made me mad every time I opened it up. A bunch of Christians wanted to be like the world. I'm like, What? We're different, man. We're peculiar people. We're like Jesus. That's, we, that's who we need to be like. They do the opposite. You know, young people, you want to be rebellious. You want to be a renegade. You want to go against the grain. Well, hey, man, sign up. Follow me around. Let's go. You want to be different? Follow Jesus. Be like Christ. You, you'll stir it up. You will stir it up. People will go, man, I don't know about you. They withdraw from, they'll, they'll want to withdraw from fellowship. You know what happens, though? There's something about once you're in Christ, you want to be with people that love Jesus. Paul needed to be with people that love Jesus. Barnabas needed to be with people that love Jesus. They found that in Antioch. But, you know, we've done some studies around here, and it's interesting that people actually do the opposite when, they're, when, they're, when they're, something is not right in their life. They'll withdraw from fellowship. You know what's interesting is the act of ministry usually is the last thing to go. They'll be busy doing something for Jesus, but what, the first thing to go is they'll withdraw. And they won't want to be around their adult Bible fellowship people. The people that are closest to them, maybe, they get a little more distant. And then they get a little bit more, their attendance gets a little bit less. And they just kind of start doing the spiritual moonwalk, right? So it looks like they're walking forward, but they're just like, they're going backward the whole time. It's like, but they're busy. They're busy in ministry. And then one day, Something falls through the cracks. And you're like, hey, what happened to so-and-so? They're gone. But they've been going. Randy and I and the pastors a few years ago, we just actually did, kind of did a matrix. We looked all the way through all the people in the church. and Man, it was a pattern. You could just see it. It's about fellowship. Relationships are huge. It's not just about showing up, listening to the preacher, entertain, get a few laughs, a few convicting moments. Go back out and live like you want to live. I mean, you can do that. You can do that here. I'm sure many do. But the purpose of the church is much deeper than that. And God wants us to get some traction. I mean, guys, the time is, is getting close. We're all going to be given an account soon. We just went through the book of Acts. So we need to act like Christ. Because, man, guys, this is going to mean something here. And sometimes I'm afraid that maybe Christians don't realize how meaningful the meetings are. I think the COVID thing's been healthy in that regard, hadn't it? I think we all have a new appreciation going, man, I'm so glad that we can assemble together on the first day of the week. Just kind of took it for granted. And uh, I tell you what, if, if you can't come, it makes a whole new, gives you a whole new appreciation. So Jesus encouraged us to be like, to be like, the churches of Antioch, the churches of Ephesus, the church of Philippi, and many other of those first century churches. And, and he said in Hebrews chapter 10, through the writer there, which I believe was Paul, but we won't get into that fight today. Hebrews 10, 23, the Bible says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You know, Paul, that's what he was doing in Rome. All the way to the end, he never wavered. He held fast. He held on. For he is faithful that promised. And let us not me, not you. Let us consider one another to provoke, unto the, uh, to provoke unto love and good works. That's what you see Barnabas doing. He, he shows up to a church that's encouraging, and he's encouraged, and he's encouraging them. And he's like, man, I'm going to add to the party. Let me grab Paul. Let me bring Paul in here. And then Paul's encouraged. Next thing you know, there's a missions movement going on. You know what the church needs right now is some encouragement. 
We need to be excited about what God is doing in our midst so that people rise up and answer the call. Not, and the call to salvation, yes. The call to service, yes. The call to be a missionary, yes. The call to be a pastor, yes. The call to advance the kingdom of God for the glory of God, yes. I'm no longer going to sublet that out to anybody else. I'm no longer going to ask God to send somebody else. God, I'm going to say, here am I, send me. Isn't that the theme this year? Be holy for I'm holy. Set yourself apart. Let God use you the way God wants to use you. And, and listen, if you forsake the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some is, you're not going to be exhorting one another. You're not going to be encouraging one another. But the Bible says do that more. Gather more, not less. Gather more. Gather more as you see the day approaching. Let's just be honest. There's, we're too busy to gather more. You know what's going to happen, beloved? This world's going to fill up our lives with so much stuff someday. You ain't going to be able to gather once a week if you're not careful. The church needs to wake it up a little bit and realize the precious nature of the assembly of ourselves together. Starting with the pulpit, but I mean in general. And I'm not trying to preach here at legalistic. you got to be here every night of the week, blah, blah, blah. We're busy. We're busy. We're busy. I get it. I'm not talking about schedules. I'm talking about encouragement. Encouragement. If you don't want to be mistaken for being like Christ, just avoid the assembly of the saints. Do it for a year. Do it for a month. Do it for six months. Do it for a year. Just check out. See what happens in your life. It's like not taking a shower. Oh, you can listen to the Christian radio all you want. You can, you can watch the TV. You can watch me online. You can do all whatever you want to do. But you just check out. And I'm not talking about people that are, you know, homebound and things like that. I'm talking about you can willingly obey the Lord, but you just choose to kind of check out. I tell you what, you're going to stink. Your life's going to stink. I'm not going to judge you for it. I'm going to love you. I'm going to, you know what? If you come back to HBF, we'll get out the hose. <laughs> We'll just hose you down and get you cleaned back off, you know. That's what we do. Wash one another in the water of God's word. And we're going to be gracious. You know why? Because any of us, our foot can slip, can't it? But Jesus keeps our feet from slipping. He keeps us where we're supposed to be. He keeps us on mission. He keeps us on point. He keeps us focused. He gives us a place where the news is off. The, the, the social media is off. It is not in the household of faith. It is not in the house of God. This is God's message. And it is the primary message of the day. It's the primary message that God has preserved for us in his word. It is the time we take once a week to say, forget everything else. Jesus is the priority. He is the priority today and he will be the priority forever. And we worship him and we're glad to do it. And we love one another. And you can't stop it, as Andy Minio would say. And so the disciples are called Christians first there in Acts 11 and verse 26. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Disciples are called Christians because they follow Christ obediently. Obediently. It's just simple. It's, Acts, it's Ephesians 6, 1, right? Children obey. I'm a child of God. Well, do we obey? If you love God, you keep his commandments. That's just all there is to it. If you don't, well, then you don't. Don't what? You don't love God. You can say you love God, but those words are cheap. Disciples are called Christians because they learn of Christ willingly. They don't have to have their arm twisted behind their back. Oh, I got to get disciple because it's the next thing on the list. Oh, Jesus, teach me. You know, come on, man. Babies like to eat, typically. Disciples are called Christians because they serve Christ charitably. Oh, man, there's something about Christians. There's love. Man, do you love your brother? I mean, this is so important to the body of Christ. That God, Jesus says, okay, in addition to baptism, now I need you to do this other thing. It's called the Lord's Supper. It's, it's reenacting the Passover feast. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Because every one of my peeps failed. And I loved them anyway. Anyone in the church ever fail you? <laughs> Rosie's like honest. Yes! 
And the rest of you are like, yes. <laughs> hey, people fail you. You ever fail yourself? Amen. I, I, I'm my, I, I fail myself. Amy and I talk to you. I'm mad at myself because I do stupid things. We fail others. We fail ourselves. But you know what? Jesus never fails. And that charity that he has for us, that grace, man, it should be manifest in our lives to everybody around us. We got lots of folks full of condemnation, full of rules, their own rules, not rules that we've imposed upon people, but they have their own rules that, that they just, they can't keep them. Or even if they do keep them, they want everyone else to keep their rules. And then they're mad at you if you don't keep their rules. It's like, hey, man, the only rule, I can barely keep what the Bible, I just want the grace to keep what God tells me I need to keep. And one of the things he, he told me to keep is a love for you. So I love you. You say, well, I did this to you. I did that. I don't care what you did to me. I did a lot worse to Jesus. And I love you anyway. Disciples are called Christians because they reflect Christ's authenticity. Uh, well, they reflect Christ authentically. I got to keep my L-Ys at the end there. Authentically. And so they're authentic. They're real. They're transparent. They're WYSIWYG, which sees what you get. And so today in the USA, we have the privilege of experiencing a little bit more what it, what it might have been like in the first century. Not a lot. I mean, uh, I don't want to get too carried away here. But what it's like, it's like, it's like what it was like to be like a Christian in Antioch. Because today, to be a Christian isn't cool like it used to be. Just 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I mean, there was a season there where the hippest thing in the world was to be a Christian and go to a mega church and, you know, party on, Garth, and wait for Jesus to come, run up the credit card. Things have changed a little bit since then. Especially the party on Garth thing. That's, that's really old. But anyway, you know, it's been over 200 years since the Bible believers in this country have seen, you know, real persecution of any large degree. But as the day grows darker, you know, we know the dawn is coming. And, you know, that's why we need, we need to have confidence. And that's my next point. But I'm not going to be able to get to that today for time's sake. I'm going to park it right there. But when we come back next week, I'll pick up the confidence that we need to have. Right? Well, today we're just going to park it on acting. Right? We need, to, we need to act like Christ. We need to be Christ to this world. Amen? And then we'll, look at the, that we'll continue to look at that confidence that we need. I'll give you several examples in that. And then we'll also see... Um, that, that we need to teach those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll look at our need to, um, to stay faithful to the Scripture to the very end. But that will come next week. So this morning, this is the first acrostic you need to get. Actively continue teaching scripture, the Scripture until the return of Christ. Are you actively in a position where you can actually even understand your Bible at all? And if you're not, you know what? It's okay. Especially if you just came to faith in Christ. When I got saved, I really did not grasp what was Genesis. What was the difference between that and Matthew? What is this division in the middle? Okay, that's before Christ. That's after Christ. Okay. I mean, I literally did not know my Bible when I got saved at all. It's okay. But you know what? Even if you don't know anything about the Scripture, if you profess Christ as Lord and Savior, you know what? You've got to learn. Because God wants you to teach it. He wants you to teach it, yeah, in, in a sense of, you know, teaching people technical information about the Bible, factoids and such and, and so on. He wants you to teach the gospel. The first thing that anyone should learn is why they're saved, how they got saved. As a matter of fact, if you can't find the gospel in your own Bible, are you saved? The devil will talk you out of it. Because the only place you're going to have faith is faith in what the Word of God says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Don't minimize the Word of God. Don't let feelings, don't allow your feelings to erase the facts. If you have the right facts, your feelings will catch up. You've got to start with the truth of God's Word. There's a lot of people that they, they, they're basing their relationship on Christ with some feeling that they've had. Feelings come and go. What you've got to base it on is the truth of God's Word. You've got to base it on the Scripture. If Paul went on his feelings, I don't think he'd have got out of bed most days. But you know what? All those apostles, they got up and they kept going because, you know what? This truth was so real that no matter how they felt about it, they, could, they couldn't help but go forward 
They couldn't help but actively continue teaching Scripture. And they were waiting for the day that Jesus would come. In every century since the first century, there's been a, a legitimate reason to expect the return of Christ. But beloved, there's been no day like today that we as a church should be ready for the coming of Christ, that we should be expecting the Lord to return. And, and is there a day when we should be ready? My goodness, we need to be ready. And we need, we need the first thing, is to really take our fellowship seriously. Take the assembling of the word, of, the assembling of the word like we're doing that, the assembling of the body, you know how much work the Lord has for us at this church? It's, it's evident that, you know, we need more people. No, not, we don't need more people to fill up the empty chairs, though that would be nice. We need more people because we have, we have aged women with arthritis who are not going to be able to sit here and roll Bibles forever. We could use some younger people that are willing to work five, six, seven days a week putting Scripture together. You say, well, that's not teaching. That is teaching. Those Bibles are going to be put in key places, in key hands, and find their way to key hearts. Beloved, I'm just saying, we've got to reproduce for Jesus' sake. We've got to be like Jesus. And we've got lots of examples of Jesus in this church. A lot of you guys are just so faithful. I just can't say enough about HBF. I can't say enough about your, your willingness to exhort one another, your willingness to encourage one another, even when... Man, you're on the front lines with your squirt gun and it seems like nobody's going to help. Like, Pastor, can you get more people to help? I'm trying. <laughs> but you know what? It's like that everywhere. Not just in our church even. Beloved, it's been like that. But you, man, you're not going to quit because you love God and you love people. And you trust Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection. And he's the one who brings life where there is no life. He's the one that brings grace when all there is is legalism. He is the one who fulfilled, fulfilled the law so that we could maybe, we may be made uh, righteous in him. And now it's the law of love. So today, if you don't know Jesus, you need to put your faith in him because he loves you. Jesus isn't just like some factoid of history. He is a real person. He is God manifest in the flesh. He died on the cross and he rose again the third day. And the Spirit of God is, is calling. In Revelation 22, the Bible says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. All who are thirsty, come. Drink of the water of life. There is nothing hindering anybody. You say, but I'm a sinner. I know. Isn't that crazy? And God is still calling you to repentance. God is still calling you to come to salvation. So if you're under the sound of my voice and you're not saved, today is the day of salvation. You need to receive Christ as Lord and Savior because He loves you. He wants you to be in a family, in a fellowship of people. And man, praise God, our fellowship goes beyond our own church. We've got a fellowship of churches. We just, I went to the all-family camp the other night. It was outstanding. I mean, God has a family. He has a, he has a network of believers that he is assembling to bring an exhortation, which means encouragement to you, so that you can move forward, so that you don't have to allow everything in this world to distract you and deceive you and beguile you for the future that God has for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in your word. I pray a blessing on the reading and the hearing uh, as we start into this uh, conclusion uh, over the book of Acts and what we need to do actionably. Lord, this week we need to be like Christ. We need to make your priorities our priorities, Father. We need to, to pray. We need to seek out others. We need to love people the way you love people. And Lord, we need to be committed to the truth and not error and go other directions that you haven't called us to go. Lord, help us to be resolute and confident like the Apostle Paul as he met with people in his house there in Rome. Heavenly Father, I pray as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice this morning that says, Brian, I'm not saved. I'm not saved. Would you just simply raise your hand and say, Brian, I need, to, I need to be saved. You say, I need to be saved this morning. Maybe you're not even sure exactly what that means. You want to know more about that. I want to know if I can be saved. Anybody? Is that a question on your heart? Hey, I pray that we all are saved this morning. If we are, praise God. Let's stand together in an attitude of prayer. Maybe you need to drop something off at the altar. Bob and Carrie are up here. They'd be happy to pray with you. Maybe you need to just, uh, to just say, hey, Brian, I need some prayer this morning. Pray for one another. Anyone say, Brian, just pray for me. Amen, several of us. Let's pray for one another. Heavenly Father, as we, as we pause here, as we stand before your throne, Lord, we know that we've met with you this morning. We know that you're speaking to us this morning, that you're, 
you want us to conclude well. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you continue to, to speak to our hearts this morning. And your saints that have hands raised, Lord, there's, I, I see Teresa here. I know her father is in a bad situation. Lord, I pray for Teresa. I pray for her situation there. And Lord, I pray, God, for uh, there's others, Lord. I just got a call last night. And I know uh, one of the folks that comes here just had a heart attack or a stroke. And Lord, there's people at home watching right now that are, uh, have serious health issues. Lord, we, we want to pray for them. And uh, Lord, we want to pray for the needs of the body. There are heart issues. There are physical issues. There are emotional issues. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that the fellowship in Christ and the fellowship of the saints, the exhortation that comes with us doing the simple things that you call us to do would just make us who it is you've saved us to be. Lord, as we follow you in obedience, as we desire you willingly, as we have a heart that is open to you, Lord, you change us. Uh, Lord, and we just thank you and praise you for making us more like you to the point that people actually call us little Christ, little Christians. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you today for the time that we've had to minister together, to look at your word. I pray a blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word. I pray a blessing on your saints. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have a, a few items of, uh, of business to attend to. First of all, today I had some folks say, are we doing the, the baby dedication? We are not. We didn't hear from any of the parents about that, so we didn't schedule it. We, did, we knew that it was coming, and, and I don't think because of COVID and everything, it must have been something that folks weren't up to. So just if you came for that, forgive us if we've somehow miscommunicated something. Uh, we did intend to have it today, but we are not having that. Uh, we just didn't have any participation, so that's why we uh, did not have that. Uh, and if there's been any miscommunication there, I apologize. Okay, uh, real quick, uh, VBS Workdays coming up. You heard Chris talk about that. You can also find on our Facebook page information about that. Uh, praise God for Sierra Leone. Can you still use some help with anything? Is it pretty much being handled? Okay, so, so stay out of Bob's way. All right, uh, praise God. In a few weeks, you'll probably be seeing Mike Pepper here in the house. That'll be cool. And Michael, uh, he's the missionary that's actually going to be distributing the Bibles. And he's literally coming here to help drive him up to Philadelphia so he can put him on the container so he can then meet his container when he gets over there. And it's pretty awesome. So uh, that'll be neat. So hopefully, I don't know what day he'll be here, but if, if we can get him in on a day where you guys can see him, I really want to do that. Um, and then um, just to understand, the men's conference is coming up August 14th, which is just like that. So if you guys could sign up for that. You need to be there. I got the Superman image. Be ready, right? We need, there's some things we need to be ready for. So uh, I'm, I'm, this is going to be an equipping men's conference. I'm pretty fired up about it already. So uh, you want to sign up, make sure you're ready for that. Um, and the Life Issues, can the Life Issues folks do, do pledges yet? So you can make pledges for Life Issues now. So Steve would be happy if you did that. Or if you want to walk or whatever they can see. Okay, there'll be a table in the lobby in August. You can get more information on that. So... All right, that's the announcements that I know of, and those are out of the way for now. But I want to do something very special this morning. Uh, you know, we talk about finishing the course and how Paul finished. We have someone today who's finishing their course here at HBF and, uh, and uh, has been here for 15 years of employment. And uh, that is Kathy Lynn Cundiff with the tiara on in the back. And so, yeah. <clears throat> So, Kathy, if you and David could make your way up here, I want to I want to just bestow some honor upon you, and uh, as is is warranted in the Bible, give honor to whom honor is due. Now, this is the first full time employee of HBF that has ever. David, you can come up too. Okay. Huh? You don't have to, but I mean, it's I, it's her day. No, we got to come up here. We had to do that because we're still doing the. Uh, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> wow, you even got the. T uh, that's pretty awesome. So, uh, Amy is going to present you with these. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to pull this out of the way real quick. Yeah. Sorry, this is not planned. <laughs> so. Ray's going, you're ripping up the cords, Brian. All right. And so, thank you. Thank you, Luke. You didn't see that, Ray. <clears throat> so, Kathy, we love you. And uh, I want to, if, uh, Steve, could you bring me the, it's, pull, pull that out of the box, please. It just You can bring me the box, that's fine. Thank you. 
Kathy, has, you've worked with us for 15 years, and all you get is this plaque. No, <laughs> no. Kathy That's knows cool. her rewards will be in heaven. But yeah, we want to present you with this plaque uh, that says, Congratulations on your retirement, Kathy Cundiff, from Heartland Baptist Fellowship, July 26, 2020, in honor of your service to Christ and His church, in recognition of 15 years of employment at Heartland Baptist Fellowship, we thank you for your faithfulness uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ and His church. And then there's a scripture uh, that is bound in here somewhere that says the labor is worthy of His reward. It's kind of a reflective oh, thing. You. So I want to That's present nice. that to you. And I just want to say I do appreciate you and all the help that you've been, uh, immense help <laughs> over the last 15 years. And you've been, she's been so faithful to the ministry here. I think we all owe her uh, in some way, shape, or form. Whether you know it or not, you owe her a debt of gratitude. <laughs> and uh, I know you do that for the Lord. But, uh, uh, and she has, uh, along with everybody on the staff, uh, they, just, they work tirelessly uh, week in and week out. And uh, we just appreciate you. And frankly, we don't have words or money or uh, anything enough to say thank you. So I just really do appreciate all the investment that you put in the church and, uh, and to the Lord. So this is yours, and I guess I should take a picture of that. <laughs> I didn't prepare a speech, but uh, let's oh, give her some heavy. love. Yeah, it is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to say anything? No? Okay. Well, praise the Lord. You need to cry. <laughs> it's mixed emotions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is not goodbye. No. Uh, but it, they are, you are preparing to move to Kentucky, so i be with the grandkids and all of that. So it's a seasonal change. And, uh, and so uh, we do love you. We appreciate you and David and all the things that, what you've meant to us at this church has been tremendous. Uh, I just want to, I just want to, um, Take a moment while we're all standing and invite you to join us for dinner. Uh, whether you knew about the dinner or not that we're having immediately after this, uh, everyone is invited. You're welcome and wanted. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, is go ahead and dismiss. And uh, Kathy is obviously the, the, uh, the reason for, for food at Heartland. So we're thankful for that. <laughs> I hope she's helped prep so many dinners over the years. And done all of that. I hope you had nothing to do with any of this today. So we, pray, we praise God for that. And so, and by the way, Luke Fleshman, who's over here, is, is uh, taking Kathy's uh, uh, duties and, and responsibilities. I think I've announced all that before, but just if you didn't know, Luke is the man now. So don't bother Kathy. Call Luke Fleshman, and uh, he will help you out. He's finding out. Yeah. <laughs> He's finding out. So, he needs some prayer. Yeah, pray for Luke. So, uh, so we appreciate that. Kathy, thank you so much. That's a heavy, heavy desk weight. Heavy. And, uh, and uh, we really do appreciate you. So God bless thank you. you and so much. I, what I want to do is, is uh, have a word of prayer. And then Jim Boyette, are you leading the charge? We're going to pray uh, as Kathy uh, transitions. And then we're going to prepare to eat. So I'm going to bring you back and pray over the food. So don't run to the food yet. Because we need to get the, the, the place set up. And... Uh, I said, Jim, we can do that in, what, 10 minutes? And he's like, no. So, uh, so 15 minutes maybe, and uh, we'll be eating. So uh, we're going to have a cookout here at HBF. We're going to set up real quick. So if you can help pitch in, seriously, the more of us that pitch in, the quicker it'll go. And uh, is there a plan that you want to announce real quick on how that's going to be done before I pray? Because once I pray, everyone's going to scatter. Yeah, I just... You need to leave any chairs down. Okay, leave the middle middle chairs down, all the others up against the wall. How high? Seven. Seven high. Seven high, and then do it, just stack them up. Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll dismiss. And by the way, you can give <laughs> on your way out the doors before you start stacking chairs. Just drop it in the box. We do not have an offering going because of COVID. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for uh, your goodness to us. We thank you for uh, just just all the things that you are. Lord, we thank you for Christ. I thank you so much for Kathy and David and, 
uh, David and Kathy, Lord, just how they've uh, been here so faithful since we were a little church plan over at the Christian school and how Kathy has uh, served uh, so faithfully and, and, uh, and taken accountability of accounting so seriously and, and made sure that we're blameless in that regard and, and helped us with the board and helped us with ministry and helped us almost like a house mom uh, doing things nobody paid attention to, cleaning and and little things around the building and, and so on and so forth for, for so many years, uh, Lord, not because uh, she was constrained to or because she was getting paid to do that, just because she loves you and she loves your church. And so, Heavenly Father, thank you for the example uh, that uh, Kathy is of what it is to be a Christian and to be like Christ. And, Lord, we're so uh, thankful, Lord, uh, for, for examples and examples in our lives. And I pray, God, that you just bless Kathy and David, Lord, in the, in the next seasons of their life and, and all the things that they have ahead of them. And Lord, I pray they know that this church loves them, that we are encouraged by them. And Lord, we want to be an encouragement to them. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for them. We thank you now and we praise you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're not dismissed, but do your thing. All right.